Welcome to an episode of About to Drop, a podcast where I interview indie artists about new music they're about to release. I'm your host, Baro Avad, aka Vertigo. I'm a pop producer that works with indie artists and songwriters to create, record, and release new music. I've found that I have a lot of similar conversations with newer indie artists I work with, and I thought it'd be useful for us to hear about other artists' processes, struggles, stories, and best practices. Hopefully you find something useful for your own career, and at the very least, find a new artist whose music you can check out. If you'd like to be featured on an upcoming episode, please go to www.vrtigomusic.com forward slash podcast. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hey everyone, this is Baro, aka Vertigo. Uh, I am here with Moon Jolly. How's it going, man? Hi, hi everyone. It's Moon Jolly here. How are you guys doing? <laughs> So we're just going to have a quick conversation about what he's been up to, the music he's releasing, uh, and just to get get to know a little more about him and, and what he's all about. Uh, so, so how's it going, man? What's what's new with you? Honestly, I'm just living life. Uh, so what's new is uh, my debut album is done. Um, uh, that's kind of new, but uh, I started skateboarding recently. I just recently started skateboarding. Um, right now, I'm just like about to promote this album that I've been working on since I was like, I think 17 um oh, wow. and then so now it's like done like it's done mm -hmm. yeah and it keeps and the thing is because i keep writing new music i kind of want to add more but i have over like 100 songs done and i'm just like i've cut it down to like 13 and even that's too much in the music industry so um i think uh yeah i'm just that's pretty much what's new I'm, I'm learning to live in the moment and be present now yeah that's something we all have to practice <laughs> yes yeah and how about you how are you doing what's that <laughs> how are you doing i'm doing good just uh you know working on stuff today i uh i recently started boxing so i had like nice. a box i had a boxing class earlier today it's, ah. it's a freaking good workout and if you want to talk about like living in the moment like when you're sparring with somebody you have to be like focused and present <laughs> you know or you're gonna get hit in the fucking face <laughs> No, I agree. It's like Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, you know, Mike Tyson, yeah. all of that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's fun so though. Cool. It's an awesome workout too. Yeah. Um, right so here. yeah, let's, uh, why don't we go over a little history about you? Like when did you start, you know, where are you located and how'd you get into yeah. everything? Yeah. So, um, I started singing music when I was about like five years old. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember my mom telling me there was this like moment when I was a little kid, I like went on the, the little chair and I just started singing. Um, but I guess my first big break, I guess, was on this TV show called The Next Star. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like big, it's kind of like, have you heard of American Juniors? No. Is it like a talent okay, show so, on TV? Or? Yeah, so it's like a talent show. So basically The Next Star, they, what they do is like thousands of kids audition and they pick uh, uh, a top six. So uh, out of those thousands of kids I got, I made the top six and they fly out to Toronto. Nice. And then you shoot a music video and then... And you kind of get groomed. You learn how to be a, a, a teen bopper. You know what I mean? It's it's really cool. They put you in this like furnished apartment. You got a handler, a driver, all that fun stuff. Cool. And like a per diem. Um, so that was like my my first uh, kind of uh, glimpse of it. And before that, I was 15 at the time. Before that, I had an audition for two other TV shows um, in in Canada. I didn't make them. I made them to the producer round, but I it never worked. And then. Uh, one day I called my mom and I was like, oh my God, the next star is there. And we went to audition and we went early morning and, um, and then I made it. It was, it was weird. Cause I didn't, I remember my mom telling me like, if you don't get it, it's fine. And we literally did not think I was going to get it. Like we literally were like, like when you go to those things, you meet so many stage moms and honest, I love, like, I hate to, there's nothing wrong with the stage mom, but you meet so many stage moms, you meet so many people that really want it. And me and my mom were just like, uh, we're just going to go and see what happens. And if, if it goes bad, I'll get McDonald's at the end of the day. You know, yeah. you know like it was just kind of whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made the first round and then I sang With You by Chris Brown. And then I made the second round and then the third round. And then uh, long story short, I made the show and then uh, they flew us out to Toronto. And then I learned how to uh, be on reality TV, how to, my, put it this way, my first time being in this studio was in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I think, 
having that experience uh, really, it, it's a blessing, but a curse because you don't realize what's going on when that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, so I, you know, I obviously didn't win the show and uh, 3 million viewers tuned in at the finale, didn't make it, but it was a really cool thing. I got to perform at Canada's Wonderland, which is like Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a fun experience. And then uh, after that, uh, after that experience, I had me and my dad, we flew, we flew up to Atlanta to work with uh, some people at SosoDeath, Jermaine Dupree's team. Okay. And uh, we did a few demos and then, and, um, but at the time I was, 50, I was literally 15 years old, just got off a TV show. I had no idea what was going on. We were just kind of following the, the wave, you know, sure. and, uh, and then we did that. We went to Atlanta, nothing really, things actually did happen. And then actually things didn't happen then, but then eventually I got an opportunity to write a song for Rihanna. Like I got an opportunity to write a song for Rihanna, which is another cool story. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that, I had went back to school, which was kind of horrible because, uh, it was just a mess going to, going to school after being on a TV show. You, you think it's funny because people think that I had the best time on being on TV, but it was actually the opposite. When you have so much attention on you at 15 years old, you have no idea who you are. And like my sexuality was already determined for me by a producer by the time that I was 15. So I never really had a chance to come out of the closet because I, th I had a girl in my music video and all this <laughs> stuff. So I had to like, and then when you're on a television network of, for kids, you're not allowed to talk about that stuff sure. anyway. So then you're bound sure. to a contract and the next thing you know, you're, you're straight for whatever. Um, Did they know when they after, signed you to it? Oh yeah, they totally knew. I remember, I remember, I'll always remember this moment. Like we were, it was right before music video and they put you on this rigorous schedule. So your call time is like 6 a.m. And then you have like, and then like, it's a rigorous schedule. It's, it's literally a schedule of like a, uh, of, of a TV star or whatever. But basically I remember being in a moment where like, uh, I told Aviva, the producer at the time, um, Aviva, I don't, want, I don't want girls in my music video. And she was like, why? And it was clear that I was, I was openly gay. And even like the stylist, everyone knew. And like the makeup artist knew. And, Unfortunately, at the time, like being a gay kid wasn't a thing, especially on a white TV show. Sure. You know, it's kind of like so white TV is kind of like Nickelodeon or it's kind of, it's like Disney. It's our it's our Canadian version of that. So, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, it would have it wouldn't have happened. Um, I mean, if it did happen, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have got kicked off the show or they would have did anything. But at the time, I was so desperate, and I think me and my mom really thought that this was going to be like my big break. You know, like. Mm -hmm. Uh, people like Aly Alyssa Reed was, uh, she has a lot of hits. She came from that show. Um, Ryland James came from the same TV show as I do. He's actually signed to Universal Republic. So there's, there have been some people from that, uh, that TV show have, who have done a lot of cool things, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and the girl, the girl who didn't win the year before me got signed to Warner Music. So this show was kind of like, um, to a jumping off point. Like, like, yeah, a jumping off point, kind of like the Mickey Mouse Club of Canada, and like, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. But honestly, looking back at it, I'm uh, as much as it was a crazy experience, I'm very thankful for that because had I not been on the TV show, I wouldn't have flown out to Atlanta, and I wouldn't have not mm -hmm. met these producers. I wouldn't have had the interest of people, you know, like. Um, Justin Bieber's guitarist Dan Cantor was actually one of the producers on the TV show. Okay. So uh, we had uh, Sean Desmond was on the TV show, mm -hmm. Keisha Shante. So there's a lot of cool people that are on the TV show and I got to meet a lot of really awesome people and I got to learn the art of show business and how to be on TV, how to talk, how to look into the camera 300 times, how to smile perfectly, how to, how to interact with people and stuff, which is a total different ball game than like real life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, now it's like I, I can do it in my sleep. I know how to be on reality TV and I know how to be someone I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I'm learning how to be me, which is really cool, which is <laughs> what the album, which is what the album is all about and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, well, let's talk about it. Like what, uh, how would you describe the sound of it? And like you are style okay, so, and genre. Yeah. So this album is urban pop. Mm -hmm. um, it's R&B music with some pop undertones. And uh, by the way, I roll my eyes a lot. So I don't know if I'm rolling my eyes. There's one, I don't know why I roll my eyes, but if I'm rolling my eyes, it's not because I'm bored. It's just because I, it's just a tendency of what I do. So I gotta be okay. careful with that. I've been told. 
Uh, so if I roll my eyes, just let me know. But it's a pop, it's an urban pop album, and it has some like, like pop undertones. Um, so I grew up with, my first album actually was Confessions by Usher. Oh, it's a classic. Uh, that was the first album I ever bought. Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, Hard for me to say that it's coming from the heart. It's been a long time coming. You know, like I grew up listening to that uh, album. And one thing that is really cool, when I flew to Atlanta, my father, uh, Brian Michael Cox, who wrote all the songs, was in the other room uh, <laughs> while I was recording some of my music. So, uh, yeah, which is insane. And then I actually got to meet him uh, this summer twice. Uh, and it was one of the best moments of my life, um, and I got to talk to him about it. But uh, what was the question again? I'm, I'm forgetting. I'm, well, I'm how to how you describe uh, your music? Like your sound? Yeah, so yeah, so it's urban music with pop undertones. I grew up listening to a lot of Usher, Justin Timberlake, mm -hmm. but I love Britney Spears, and I grew up listening to like a lot of Katy Perry, you know, in the 2000s. So um, it is R&B, but it has pop flair, and like it's it's very like it's. It's pop structure, you know, like a verse, chorus, pre-chorus, whatever the heck it is. And then there's some songs that kind of, uh, kind of lean away towards that. And I've been dabbling with hip hop and stuff. So it is an R and B album. It's an urban pop album, um, mm -hmm. but it has some pop music. And I think it's, it's a more, it's a modern take of R and B music. Um, and then I have a country. I have, a, I have a few country records on there, like a little bit of it. Um, but it's, it's when you listen to it. It's, for for marketing purpose, it's an R and B album. There you go. There you have it. Sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've clearly had a lot of discussion about it, but it's an urban. It's an urban. Can I say urban pop? Is that even a genre? I guess so. Yeah. I, know okay. yeah. I don't know. I think I think iTunes would probably categorize it as R and B, but mm -hmm. um, it's R. It's it's urban pop. It's urban R and B, uh, and yeah, it's just it starts off with a song called Younger Self, and it ends with Following My Dreams. And uh, it's just an album that talks about the past three years of being in the industry and, and, and writing with different people. You know, I wrote some of these, some of my best songs in LA, um, in Toronto, in Montreal, in New York, and, and in Atlanta. So uh, I got to really travel a lot and, and, and work with different producers um, and kind of figure out the kind of artist that I am. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so um, it's very emotional, that's for sure. There's a lot of, there's a lot of songs about love. There's a song called My Southern Bell is Donald. There's a song called Timothy. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other names on there. There's a song called White Line, which has a song, which is which is kind of correlated to Timothy. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of my inspirations, like like Dolly Parton, who, who I love songs that are very authentic and real. So that's why I use names in my songs. And um, I'm not supposed to talk about this person. I'm going to anyways, but Taylor Swift, the reason why I'm not allowed to, because apparently I'm not supposed to, but I say whatever I want. So I love Taylor Swift. I know some yeah, people don't, great. but I, I love Taylor Swift. I think she's a sick ass songwriter mm -hmm. and, uh, she has inspired me actually when I was 15, I got a guitar and I learned 15 by Taylor Swift. So she has really inspired my songwriting mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a songwriter that like, I like to, if I go through a relationship or whatever, I'll write about it. If someone hurts me, I'll write about it. That's kind of the way that I express myself. And some people find that it's oversharing, but I don't know, it's, it's art, you know, like I would rather write about something that's real than fabricate something. Cause then it's like, it doesn't, there's no connection. So yeah. yeah. I mean, I think some people might think you're oversharing, but on the flip side, I think there's a lot of people that would really appreciate that and connect with it a lot stronger than, than if you were being vague or, or anything like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I do have those songs, you know, like for example, Tommy Jeans, uh, which is a single that I put out. That song is a more fun song and it's, it's, it's kind of vague, but it's actually inspired by, sorry, I love Frank Ocean. I forgot to mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. Frank Ocean is a big, big, big inspiration to me. Um, and uh, yeah, but that's what my, my album is just, it's, it's R&B. It's really fun. It, there's songs that'll make you dance, like over. There are songs that make you cry, like Timothy, and there's songs that'll make you feel good about yourself. I'm a song called Self Love Till It Hurts. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I had to learn throughout this whole experience is the relationship with myself, which is something that I've had trouble maintaining. And I've never really had the chance to really take some time off and like really look at what I've done or, or what I've been able to do. So I've realized through trial and error that it's really important to take care of yourself. So a lot of the songs are about that. Um, 
but yeah, it's just it's a story about a boy that just wanted to sing and 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 then follow the last song is called Following My Dreams and it's uh it talks about me wanting to move into dropping out of university, which I did, and then moving to California and all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm. So um I think a lot of people will there's a song for everyone on that on this album for sure. It's awesome. So what Thank uh, you. Is, is this your your first release? I've had so I've had songs. So my first ever song was called If You're Mine. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was produced by if I'm f- for uh, SA Track Works. Um, was when I was 15. It was released through Warner Music Canada, and I had another single called Turn It Up. So two music videos when I was 15. And then when I was 17, I released an EP, a six song EP, which I uh, got got taken down. Um, because at the time, I felt. I felt like they didn't really represent me, um, but it's actually funny enough, STD, which I released, is actually was on the was on the EP. So some of some of the songs that I put out are songs that I've actually recorded like years ago that I just think are so cool and so dope. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, this is going to be my first official like proper release with songs that I actually am totally behind mm-hmm. that I actually wrote. Ninety, I I think I wrote ninety seven percent of. The words, if not everything. That's um, um, yeah, and I, and there's nothing wrong with help. I've had a lot of help, obviously, but um, my first song I wrote two lines, and now I'm, now I've written everything. And I, and I, and I. The reason why I'm very adamant on saying that I wrote those songs is because I think it's so important to talk about that. I feel like a lot of people don't realize how how much work it takes and how much. Uh, persistence and discipline it takes to write music and to learn how to write songs mm-hmm. you know and and to learn how to like i remember there were studio sessions where i would go and i would cry like like i wouldn't be able to write songs and now i can write them because it's a skill mm-hmm. and you really have to write songs every single day to get better and like in order to have 10 good songs you need like 300 you know mm-hmm. and um that's the only way you get better um and luckily i was able to, i was taught that like it's all about the song. And if you, a, a good song is a good song on the guitar or piano. It yeah. doesn't matter if there's auto tune or whatever it is. If it's mm-hmm. not, if it's not good stripped back, it's not a good song. And um, I really learned how to write a good song and I'm still learning to this day how to write better songs and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's why I'm so excited about the new music, which I shouldn't talk about, but uh, <laughs> For now, this stuff is really cool. Yeah, that's always a situation, right? You're getting ready to release one album, and you have a whole album's worth of other material ready to go. <laughs> oh, dude, I have like literally, I could release probably like four out al- four albums or five. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it would just be redundant. Like it would, it would be, mm, I don't know. I mean, I already know what the name of my second album is called, but and mm-hmm. I've been writing it and stuff. But right now, I'm going to be living in this album right now. Um, but I'm. I'm always, I think looking back now, like there are songs like Timothy where I wish I I, I wrote it differently or whatever, because a lot of my music on this album, you'll, you'll find that it's it's a lot of victimizing. It's always like, this person did me wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. But I've had to learn that, well, yeah, that person did you wrong, but I put myself in those situations, you know? Yeah. And held it, holding myself accountable. So I feel like, as I'm, I'm going to be turning 24 next year. Sorry, no, no, next month actually. So I've, I've, I've matured a lot. Like Timothy was written two years ago. So as a 20, 21 year old, like you, you don't know as much, you know. And I, I thought I was a know it all. You think and you now do. I'm realizing you think you that I'm not a know it all. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm like, oh my god, I should have listened. You know, had I, had I listened more, had I. I remember my my former team was like, are you really sure you want to put a song out called Timothy? And at the time, I was like, yes. And and now I'm like, when I listen to that song, I'm like, oh God, like the fact that I wrote a song called Timothy and then like, it's so, like I say his ex-girlfriend's name in the, in the, in the, in the bridge. It's, it's cute. It's great. It's great music, but I just, I just, I could have been more, more uh, creative with it, but like, whatever, like it is, it is what is, it is. Are they real people or are they like names you're using? Oh, everything is real. Everything, like in my song. Like you didn't change lines, their name for the song? <laughs> No, uh, trust me. Like, to, <laughs> no, like I have a song called White Lines, and Timothy's voice is actually in the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, he left me a voicemail. I had uh, my first my first single on my album is called was called White Lines. Uh, I'm really proud of it because I got 
it got on the Fresh Fries playlist and it got 10,000 streams in the first week, which is super cool. Nice. And we didn't, we didn't put, we spent like, I think $10 on Facebook ads mm -hmm. and it, it did pretty well. And, and, uh, the reason why we didn't push it is because of the fact that it was about cocaine. And, um, and honestly, I, I always, I feel like, um, it's, an, I don't know. I, I remember I was speaking with the publicists at the time and they were just kind of like saying like that we shouldn't push this song out because it's a bad message. But I always was, I always, was, I always told them, I was like, well, I made a mistake. I, I did blow one night and, and I wrote a song about it and I'm over it. It's like three prides ago. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I don't need to be doing blow. I smoke weed. And I feel like that's a positive message. I feel like acting like I don't do anything is so dumb because like most kids in university, like, dabble with drugs and I went to university and I went to college so I felt like I feel like it's important to be honest and um yeah, yeah. so I mean you're not glorifying or anything you know I mean like no but he's like all of his songs are about doing blow <laughs> yeah well I yeah, had a publicist tell, I had a publicist tell me like you will if you go if you do this then you could ruin your career and like and I was like but I'm 23 years old like every uh, everyone in my age group has done blow or LSD and to be honest I'm literally the most goody two shoe person like I I I don't even I barely drink I can barely handle a drink mm -hmm. you know what I mean like I just uh, I'm just a little bit of a wild child because I have I've had a sheltered life but like I don't know like the most that I do now is smoke a joint and even so like that's that's like legal is it legal in America it's legal in some places and not in others how about in, in where you're from? I don't want to tell people where you're from. In, in case, oh, I'm you know. in Pennsylvania right now. I don't think it's legal. Like you can get CBD uh, oil and stuff like that. Of that, yeah. Um, which I haven't messed around with, but like I don't think you can actually like go buy, buy pot. Oh my god, dude! I love pot. It's <laughs> it's, but I but I use it for like holistic approaches, and uh -huh. I don't want to. And I don't want to. Sorry, I feel like. Uh, I don't want to promote actually you know what my thing is i i've realized through trial and error is that i am me and i will do what makes me happy but i will never ever promote doing anything that could potentially give you psychosis so there are studies that say that marijuana can lead to psychosis so i just think that if someone does want to dabble with marijuana that they should talk to their healthcare professionals. I don't know. I sound like a commercial. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think, you know, a little, a joint here and there is good for you. You know, it's, it has a lot of benefits and, uh, someone like me who's very anxious, I get really anxious. Like smoking a joint does definitely helps me. Um, but I'm not smoking and driving and I'm not, I'm not like at like, I don't know, like I would never smoke a joint if I was going to the doctor. Like that seems dumb to me, but mm -hmm. I don't know. But I don't know. Who am I to judge? I mean, it's, it's illegal over here, but I mean, I don't think it should be illegal. I mean, alcohol is way worse for you. Smoking oh, cigarettes is way me. worse for you. I don't smoke yeah. just because like I'm the opposite. If I smoke, I get ridiculous anxiety. <laughs> really? So Are you smoking the right stuff though? I mean, no. I mean, like I've gotten like good stuff from like real dispensaries and like from like different parts of the country. But yeah. like... I don't know. Like if I if I if I'm gonna smoke, I have to be by myself. <laughs> mm. I don't want to be around people. Honestly, I I don't I don't blame you. Um, I started smoking weed. If you want to know my service for weed, I started smoking weed in when I I think in my second year of university. Mm -hmm. uh, my first time drinking alcohol when I was sixteen. I puked in a trailer park, and I hadn't touched and then my dad picked me up and I never drank for two years after that. And then when I was 18, I tried alcohol again. And then when I went to university, I tried smoking weed and I had a roommate that introduced me to weed. And I remember I used to be so scared of smoking weed by myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then when I moved to Toronto, when I was about, I think 21, that's when I started buying my own weed. And I used mm -hmm. to be, I used to feel so scared buying weed and like rolling. I'm like the worst, uh, roller uh -huh. whatever, but yeah. Um, but yeah, honestly, usually wouldn't ever, if you ever come to Canada, I would love to show you some. So in Toronto, they have CBD drops, which is like oil, mm -hmm. like THC oil, which is super good for you because as a vocalist, 
smoking is not good for you, but they have right. so many, so many things, things to make you feel happy, whatever the fuck it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but meditation, sorry, meditation and going to the gym and eating well are things that you can do um, to help, which is something that I'm really, I'm a big advocate on like um, fitness and, and sure. eating well. So yeah, but I don't know. Hmm. Each to their own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you. Like I, th I think our country is a little behind and we should be legalizing that shit. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, California. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually wearing a Los Angeles t-shirt actually yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's get off drugs. Um, yeah. so can, you, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about the writing, production, and recording process for everything? Like how did it all get put yeah. together? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so there's, do you like how it all started? I mean, just the like okay, so cool. Just like in generalities, so, like how I mean, you said yeah. it, it, it happened over like a long period of time, right? You've been writing for yeah. A while. So, so when I had moved to before I had moved to Toronto, there was an A and R at Eve Kids Entertainment, which is so they they signed Alessia Cara, and when I had I had signed, so I forgot to say this, but I had signed after the next star, um, I had signed an independent deal with these two awesome people from Montreal, and we did some music together, and then that I got out of that deal and then I had all of this music and I was sending it to a whole bunch of ANRs and one ANR at EP Entertainment really loved what he heard and he flew from New York all the way to Toronto and I met with Warner, Sony, all these cool publishers and um, I had a whole bunch of sessions with different producers and I met these producers uh, called Young Wolf Hatchlings and they produced Uma Thurman um, on the Hot 100, it's mm -hmm. number two on the Hot 100. And I had a session with people all week, and the only session that clicked was with these two guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why I clicked is because when I went to the studio, I could be myself. I was like, it, it was I could talk about guys, girls, whatever I wanted. And we wrote a song called "Lost in Love." And when I, when we had after that session, my A and R told me, if you find a connection with someone, then you have to you have to go on that. So what I did is. I texted these producers every single day, right? and um, and my theory is until someone says no to you, you keep going. Yeah. And uh, luckily, one of the producer Jarrell, he texted me the day before my birthday. He's like, "Hey, you're a very talented guy, and I would love to work with you again." So I was going to Ottawa U at the time, and what I would do is I would take the 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 midnight bus and get to Toronto at six a.m. Wait at the Starbucks until from six a.m. to nine, and then go to the studio from like nine to nine p.m. and then take the bus back to Ottawa and then go back to school and I would do that like every single week and then eventually I had moved to Toronto and I had written this song called Alive in my bedroom in Ottawa which kind of changed everything it it got the attention from people from Universal Polydor, Universal and all these cool ANRs and that song Alive which you'll hear on the album um it kind of opened up the doors and then I started I learned how to write songs I learned how to like I don't know, write songs. So usually what I do is I'll take a guitar and, uh, for example, uh, so there's here's set of floor, right? I'll go to the studio and I'll be like, yo, like, I just had a vision about set of fill. And then the producer will either, either I'll go on the guitar, I'll come with an idea and I'll be like, set of fill, set of fill, set of, set of fill. And then we'll just like, kind of like hash it out and the next, you know, the song's done. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays, like, I usually like, most times I'll come with the song already done, you know yeah. what I mean? Or I'll come with ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like writing to tracks, it depends. But my favorite my favorite way of writing music is being in the studio and like listening to the drum kicks and like picking things. Mm -hmm. um, just because I'm very involved. Um, but it, it really all depends. Sometimes it could be a word, it could be a melody. Like mm -hmm. um, I'm inspired by people, that's for sure. I have a thing about I have a type. So, mm -hmm. um, but my reporting process usually um, I'm really big on using the vocals in the first day on the on the final record because I find that those are like the best vocals ever because sometimes you you really get that emotion. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's kind of my my process nowadays. Like I just I because I know better. I know to finish. Like I would rather go to a session with an idea already done. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and stuff like that. That kind of helps. Or like. A concept sometimes I'll write down like a notebook with like words if I'm like out and about and someone says like plethora 
which I've never been able to use in a song, but like I'll, I'll write down plethora and then I'll write a song about plethora mm -hmm. um, and stuff, or thesaurus or whatever. So that's kind of my process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what uh, what kind of challenges did you run into while while putting this thing together? Uh, um, dealing with my sexuality, kind of finding out ways to be myself in my music without being so uh, direct. Uh, that was something that I found very difficult. Um, and also just digging deep, you know, like really like uh, digging deep and writing songs from a not a surface level perspective. Mm -hmm. um, because as, as you may know, being an artist is a very taxing thing. And people, and I used to always make fun of artists when they're like, oh my God, I cried in the studio. And I always used to be like, what the fuck? Like, how is that even possible? But mm -hmm. it actually is possible because when you're in the studio and you're writing this music, you're enabling your feelings and emotions. And it, and I've had such a I've cried. So mm -hmm. I think confronting my emotions or not being truthful and uh, kind of hiding things. Um, there's a song on my album called Cry for Help, which talks about um, some of the lyrics are like, I was 20, I was young, I just wanted to have fun, blah, blah, blah. And talking about uh, my mental health. And like that song was really hard to write because uh, my producer kept pushing me. He's like, I want you to dig deeper. And uh, that's hard. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you only realize what you go through while writing it. And then after listening to it, you're like, holy shit, that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's so therapeutic. So that's something that I, I, that I had trouble with. And also, um, I'm dyslexic. Mm -hmm. So I always switch words. I remember I, my, a good engineer had told me that uh, I, when I sing, I skip words sometimes. Um, and now I'm more aware of that. But me being dyslexic and whatever has been a trouble and like with numbers and stuff. But I mean, now I'm better. I'm now at it. But definitely that's been hard, hard, hard um, dealing with your dyslexia and like, mm -hmm. like mixing words and numbers and stuff and like with rhythm, like playing to a metronome that that was like a hell to me playing with a metronome. Oh, yeah. I'm like, that trips people up. <laughs> yeah. But can we just say that singers have the worst rhythm? That's what I've told. That's what I've been told now. Uh, yes and no. I've been lucky. I've had people that are pretty, pretty good with their timing. I don't know. I'm good at it now, but like seven, like two years ago, like, ugh, I hated it. But now, but honestly, I don't like playing guitar. I don't, I don't enjoy playing guitar on tracks. It's not really my thing. It's mm -hmm. my thing if I have to, but, um, I know what my strengths are now. Actually, this is something that I want to say. With experience, now I know what my strengths are. You know, my strengths are top line and melody. I've always said this, I'm not the best lyricist in the world I'm getting better at it, but I think knowing knowing how to like read a room, understanding how to be in a session, understanding how to delegate things, you know, um, that was something that I struggled with a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and staying on task. I have ADHD as well. So like right now I'm probably saying so many things because I talk too much, but being in a studio, you have to, if you're gonna, if you're gonna write a song, you have to commit to it. Bit, you know, I mean? and that's something that I had so much trouble with because yeah. I get bored very easily. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, you, you have to push through those those um, those rough patches when like the song isn't quite working yet. You know, you really got to push yeah. through that stuff and stay focused. Well, now if the song's not before, I used to go with it. But if something's if I'm not feeling something, I usually say it right away, not after the end. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm really. I, I usually, it's a feeling, you know, you, when you hear a kick drum or a beat, like you feel it and like, that'll like propel, like, like if I hear like a good beat or whatever, or a good concept, like I can write the song in a second, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and there's some songs that take time, you know, um, but honestly, the best songs that I've ever written have been always like, like this, the quick ones, kind yeah. of easy. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I have songs like Tim Timothy actually was a song that I had, I brought to California and it didn't work. I had brought it to Venice beach, did not work. And then as soon as I got back to Canada, I cried and it came out of me and I wrote it in like, literally like, it was like a one take. And then I went to the studio the next day and it was done. Mm -hmm. You, you yeah, wonder so. if like all that other stuff had to happen before you could write it out like in a few minutes, you know? Yeah. 100%. You have to go through it and you have to live it. And like, you have to be also real with yourself. You know, one of the things, that I learned about that whole relationship is that like, 
just because someone's nice to you doesn't mean they want to have sex with you. And there's a beauty in platonic relationships. There's different kind of relationships. And that has to do with my childhood and stuff. So I had to learn so many lessons and like going to, going to therapy while being in the studio has helped a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so making music is part of the equation, right? What are you guys doing to promote and market and like, what's the, uh, you don't have to go too into detail. Yeah. Like, what's the general idea of how you're getting it out there so people know about you? Yeah. So uh, it's no trouble that I my mouth gets me in so much trouble. So now I am luckily I am transitioning with teams now. I I'm really blessed to work with some really awesome people that that understand me and understand the vision. So we're doing this thing where we're releasing a song every Monday at 11:59. Um, it's called Moon Mondays, and I'm going to be putting out some more singles. And I guess I can tell you when the album's coming out. So the album is going to come out on October 29th on my 24th birthday. Okay. Um, and uh, the reason why I delayed it a month more is because I wrote some extra songs, which I think are going to be, which are a little more, which are better. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to do a, a strong, hard uh, digital campaign. And then uh, I'm going to do some press, some radio little things, play the guitar at some radio stations um, in Montreal and Toronto and Ottawa and stuff. And then, yeah, just kind of play some shows. I want to I want to play a show in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of really push it for the next six months in Canada and then kind of see where it goes. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully some label um, will um, help me out a little bit, you know, once mm -hmm. I, once I figure out, um, this is so. This is my first time really being an independent artist. I don't even. I don't even really can. I would. I am an independent artist, but I still have a lot of help. So, I think. Um, uh, I just want to do things on my own right now to kind of see what I want to do. You know, mm -hmm. I think for the longest time I've been told how to be, what to do, and whatever it is. And now that I know who I am as an artist, and I'm very confident in it. I kind of want to, like, I want to play some, like, dive bar shows, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, like, I want to play some, like, 50 cap rooms, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. You know, I want to, like, I, I don't know. I know what it's like being flown out. I know what it's like having a handler. I know what it's like being fed Uber at home and all that stuff. And none of that stuff made me happy. Like, I had, I literally had, like, a $30,000 music video, and that didn't make me happy. So I just think that now, like, uh, I'm just doing things on my own. Like I'm, I have some friends and we've made some like cool VCR videos of my music videos and stuff like that. So I'm really just like being, I'm just being an artist. I'm just like doing things on my own strategically. Okay. Um, but the way we're going to promote it is on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. And then get some cool blog posts um, and stuff and things like a podcast, stuff like this. Right, right. Um, but I'm just doing, I'm just doing things that feel good to me, you know, that mm -hmm. don't feel contrived or forced. And, um, yeah. And to be honest with you, can I be real? Honest? I just, yeah, whether a hundred people stream it or a thousand or a million, I just don't care. Cause it's just like, um, I'm very, I love the music that I wrote. And like, if one person loves it, then that's awesome. Cause like, yeah, I would rather cool. have 10, I'd rather have a hundred real fans than buy a thousand real fans, you know, because that's not, um, that's just not, that's not, I'm not, in, I'm, I say that I, um, do you know what a fidget spinner is? Yeah. So I studied marketing. So I'm not trying to be a fidget spinner. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to make a career and I want a long lasting career. So if this album doesn't work, there'll be another one and another mm -hmm. one and another one, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not in it to, to become famous. I mean, obviously I would love to be famous tomorrow. I would love that success and stuff, but, um, I don't know, man. Like I, I want to sell 50 copies of my first album, like 50 physical album sales or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever people buy, you know, I think that's an accomplishment and, yeah, for sure. um, and yeah, you know what I mean? And like this, if you want to sell a million records, you got to meet a million people. So, um, I definitely want to tour and I know in Europe you can tour a little, um, a little better there so that's something it's just, that's a place that i i do plan on going mm -hmm. um but i don't know um for now for the next six months i'm pushing it in canada and 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 seeing where that takes me and then i might go across the pond for some meetings soon are, so, are you doing yeah. uh the u.s also or are you really just trying to focus all your marketing in canada um 
you know, the U.S. is a market that it's such a big market, and I mm-hmm. uh, like for the Facebook side, yes. Um, but I never really had like the only places that I could go play shows are in like New York, Atlanta, and LA, which are cool places. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I definitely want to promote it in America, which would be great. But um, I don't know. I feel like you have to make it in your hometown. You know, you have you really yeah. have to build a, a a thing. I do think that like. Um, I find personally, and this might get me in trouble. I find that Canadians don't really understand me. And to be honest, I wasn't even born in I wasn't born in Canada. I was born in Africa, mm-hmm. in the Congo. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a Canadian citizen. So I've always found that people from Europe have always accepted and embraced me, and Americans have for some reason. I mm-hmm. don't know. I think there might be Canadians think I'm too crazy. They think I'm because Canadians are very nice and diplomatic, and they say sorry, and then I have this big personality, and I'm like, well. I just shat my pants and that's not like, I don't know, Americans love that stuff. And then European people yeah. think I'm cool or funny. And Canadians are like, oh my God, this kid's like either erratic or weird. So that's kind of been hmm, that's a thing. So my, yeah. So my dream in the perfect world, it would be to either sign to a major in America or, or the UK or like some cool indie label. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I don't know. I feel like I want to, I want to hold on. I want to do it for as long as I can independently mm-hmm. until I can anymore. Right. Um, and that could, yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, you should keep but, control I mean, of as much of your own career as you can until, until it gets yeah. like, beyond your control, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I just had a lot of bad experience with like labels and people and stuff. So I just like, now I'm just like, uh, actually, now I actually have an entertainment lawyer now. Mm-hmm. So now nothing bad will actually I should say this. There's no problem with signing to a major label. It's just like now I'll be aware of what I'm signing. So yeah. that's probably that has been the issue my whole life. So now I now that I have someone taking care of that, like it'll be fine. But um I just need to be authentically myself. Is authentically even a word? I think so. Okay, think well so. we're gonna make it a word. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you yeah. mentioned one thing earlier. I think a lot of people that, like, I work with a lot of indie artists. Um, you said that you had like put together a team. A lot of people I talk to are like, they're always like, "Oh, like, do I need a manager? Do I need an attorney? Like, how how did you go about yeah. putting a team together to like uh, to work with you?" I mean, luckily, by the grace of God, because of that TV show, people just kept coming to me and stuff. And like, honestly, like. It, I've never really actively sat up, sought out a manager. It's always, it's always has come to me. Um, but I do think, and this is an advice that I've told, that I've, I've been told. So, in order to be managed, you need to have something to, you need to have stuff to be managed for. So, right. I think, don't for my my advice to young artists, it's like don't look for a manager. Don't do that. Just do your like focus on like building relationships with producers. Um, songwriters and stuff and like go to the studio like I used to go to the studio and I even say I used to like literally be like can I come to a session and just listen and the reason why I did that is because I wanted to first of all I might get publishing because I might because I'm really good at melodies so like of course they asked me for their advice yeah but just learning and 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 when you're in a studio like I used to be at Dreamhouse Studios and Dreamhouse Studios is where a lot of my albums recorded and like uh, the weekend did uh, uh balloons what's that album balloons oh, crap his first one yeah but Ball- house of balloons he recorded oh, yeah, okay. house of balloons daniel caesar recorded some like i remember there's a song called echo which i don't think will be on my album when i was recording that daniel caesar was in the other room and then a year later he won a grammy so oh. what i'm trying to say is that it's people you will when you're in this industry you'll meet so many people and like you'll you'll just like You'll, you'll be in a studio one day and then you'll meet like the weekend's lawyer and then the weekend's lawyer will be like, what do you do? And then you'll like, you'll like play him his music and then he'll introduce you to someone else and then you'll meet a manager or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, like the way that I found my manager is like at the time, my former managers, I was in Loblaws and I saw this guy who's like my brother at the, now um, and he had freckles and I went up to him and I was like, you, I think you should be a model. And then his mom worked in film Mm-hmm. and invited me to dinner one day and then next thing you know she found out about my music and then she introduced me to her friend her i don't i don't know if they're friends but her, she introduced me to a colleague who worked at another film studio and then they met with they met with me so it nothing happened overnight like it 
it like before I even had a manager, I was like, I was in the studio for like a year. So like, mm -hmm. I think you have to really just be in the studio. You have to like put yourself in situations where that'll happen. Uh, but no one's going to manage you if you don't have any music. I mean, people do, but most times, like when that happens, you'll get abused and used. So I think my advice to young artists is just to stay in the studio and learn how to learn how to write, learn, pick up an instrument, first step, get an instrument, whether it's a guitar, a piano, a clarinet, learn that and learn how to write songs and then go to studios and just offer your time, either be a studio assistant, be a water boy, um, always what's in it for me, you know what I mean? So like, if you go to a studio and you meet a producer, be like, oh my God, can I be your assistant? Can I, can I get your coffee? Can I blah, blah, blah. And yeah. like most times people will say yes, it's all about hunger. So, mm -hmm. um, and then eventually people will hear about your work ethic and then managers will be flooding your door and stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question. No, I think that's super helpful. Cause I, there's a lot of like, you know, a lot of indie artists I'm working with, they're, they're doing it all by themselves and they're not sure how to like put all the pieces together, you know? Mm -hmm. so but there's also an, there's also an art of delegation. I think in order to have an hello, oh you have to pee. Oh, someone has to pee. One <laughs> second. No, wait, I'm in the bathroom. One second. No worries. Sorry. No worries. Um. Um. Here, say hi to this little kitty over here. Hey, kitty. Um. <laughs> hey. Um, you have to delegate things. You can't be a jack of all trades, but with the internet and Spotify, like we live in an era where you can literally like go on a, you can use a blue Yeti mic and like put like a compressor on your song and like rip a instrumental and put it on Spotify. And like, so I think like, you don't really need a manager these days, um, to do things, but I mean, it's, you you do need a manager eventually, but I think artists should just focus on like being good at their art and like understanding how to write music. Because if you don't know if you don't know how to write music, then that's there's two ways to go about it. You can either be a pop star that doesn't write songs and you can have songs fed to you, but then with that comes like not being able to control who you are or whatever it is. So if you understand your musical ability and you take time honing your craft and understanding yourself as an artist, then it'll be it'll it'll be much better for you in the longer run because when you do meet these managers, whatever, you'll be able to show them value mm -hmm. and you'll be able to stand your ground more, you know? Yeah. Um, more and that's my, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, every story is different. You know, I know people that like literally like did one song and got a manager and then got signed, you know, there's no, there's no formula to it. Yeah. Um, it's just hard work, hard work and dedication and really, and I can't stress this enough, like, it's all about the song. Mm -hmm. Clothes can be bought, likes, Instagram, playlisting, all of that. But if the song's not good, then, like, it's not good. So yeah, that's, true. that's my advice. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we've been chatting for, like, an hour, so I don't want to keep you. Um, where, where can people... Oh, really? Is it an hour? Whoa. Oh, really? Shit. 15 minutes? Wow. We're pushing it. Um, but, yeah, so where, where can people find you? You know, um, where are you on, like, your socials? Where are you active? And is there anything else yeah. you want to tell anybody? Um, so people can find me on Instagram, which is what I use all the time. So it's Moon Jolly. It's with three O's because I can't, I don't own Moon Jolly apparently. Um, and then on mm -hmm. Facebook and Twitter, it's Moon Jolly Music. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm more active on Instagram um, and stuff. And then, um, oh, and, and I shot a music video. Uh, to my song, my southern Miles Donald, and Converse Canada was really lucky. I was very lucky because they gifted me a whole bunch of shoes and um, and a cool outfit. Um, so oh, I got nice. to meet with Converse Canada. I was really excited about that. Um, and then what else? Um, I don't know. I just I think my main message to people. I just want people to be themselves. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of my motto. And um, I hope that anybody that is listening to this like always read what you sign and always stand up for your rights and own all your masters all right yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know if that helps but yeah <laughs> no that definitely helps yeah. right? for sure um all right well thanks for yeah. taking the time uh, to talk with us um we'll we'll be in touch about when we're gonna release and everything yeah oh and it comes out october 29th and every song every monday and over comes out september 16th and it's my first dance hall song. I wrote it in LA. So that's something that I, and then, yeah. Say bye.
<laughs> What's your cat's name? Sorry. Um, Ozzy. Ozzy? Say hi. Yeah, Ozzy. He's kind of shy. Hi, Ozzy. Oh, he doesn't like the, the spotlight. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you got something useful out of it. If you did, please like, subscribe, comment, and share this series with your friends. If you like the artist and want to check out more of their work, please go to the show notes at vrtigomusic.com slash about to drop. Thanks again and stay tuned for the next episode.